Firstly, this presentation and the subsequent question and answer session um, are being live webcast and recorded for posterity. So just keep in mind um, as you participate in the discussion. Next week, we'll have another luncheon talk, um, February the 7th, here in Wasserstein, but on the second floor in Milstein EC um, room. Uh, and that talk is bottom up constitutionalism, the case of net neutrality by Christoph Greiber, uh, Berkman Klein fel uh, faculty associate and professor at the University of Zurich. And the luncheon talk after that on February 14th, it would be Hyperloop Law, Autonomy, Infrastructure, and Transportation Startups with the General Counsel of Hyperloop One, Marvin Amore. Um, and at this point, I will turn the microphone over to Mary Gray. Hey, everybody. Resist, resist. <laughs> we are the people. People united cannot be defeated. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dan Green, our speaker today. He's my colleague at Microsoft Research. He's a postdoc with us this year on the job market, um, FYI. His work focuses on um, the future of work and its shadow, uh, unemployment. Um, he's a former social worker and came to us from the American Studies program at University of Maryland. Uh, he's probably one of the most um, uh, knowledgeable people I know about the history of labor and how it intersects with uh, contemporary debates about what makes somebody skillful or unemployable or um, important. And I feel like his work is uh, so necessary today. So please join me in welcoming Dan Green to the stage. And if, uh, oh, go ahead, clap, 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 clap. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and a couple of reminders, we, uh, this is recorded. There's a hashtag you'll see on the board, BKC Harvard, if you'd like to, to shout out anything. Um, and uh, if you could hold your questions until the end of the presentation, that would be, that would be wonderful so that we can have them uh, as part of a, a robust Q&A. OK, with that. Thank you so much, Mary. Is that coming through? Microphone? No, not at all. Yellow. There we go. I'm just tired. Good. Ish. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You all have made your five calls today, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you go to fivecalls.org over here. You get a script and who to call for both of your senators, your representative, and two fantastic executive branch people who surely, surely want to hear from you. OK, so I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes, and we'll open it up for discussion. So thank you very much, Mary, for the very generous introduction. I'm Dan, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the Social Media Collective at Microsoft Research. Uh, and I'm an ethnographer using the tools of cultural, organizational, and labor studies to explore how we learn how to work through information technology. So this talk in my current book project, tentatively titled The Promise of Access, Hope and Inequality in the Information Economy, is about how the problem of poverty becomes a problem of technology, why we understand inequality in that frame and not others, and how the push to learn to code or else changes what a school is for or what a library is for. Here I draw on three years of field work and interviews of more than 70 entrepreneurs, service providers, patrons, and students to show how digital divide thinking emerges from concrete processes of organizational reform in an era of skyrocketing inequality. I spend time with Washington, D.C.'s civic-minded startups, public libraries, and tech-focused charter schools, and I show how organizations feeling a resource crunch because of government austerity and the overwhelming problems of urban poverty, or a crisis in political legitimacy, because who needs a school or a library now that everything's online, how they begin to focus their operations on the digital divide in order to resolve these external pressures. In the process, public institutions like schools and libraries begin to talk and walk more like startups. But ultimately, this takes them away from their core social service mission. Today, we'll spend most of our time talking about one institution given purpose and direction, but also riven by conflict and forced to depart from its mission through its embrace of this hopeful idea that structural poverty can be overcome with the right tools and the right skills, namely DC's public libraries. 
to conclude, I'll map a new theoretical and empirical direction for digital divide studies in what I call technologies of inequality. So let's get started. So these posters started appearing on the DC subway system, largely in those neighborhoods still majority black, in 2013. Each one in the series declares the internet. Your future depends on it. Next to a photo of a working class black Washingtonian and their story about using the DC government's digital training resources to get a good office job, often after a career in the service industry. So one of them explicitly calls out, you know, I spent 20 years as a beautician, but now I'm at a desk. And then there's instructions to text for more details. So what I want to know is why does your future depend on the internet and not unions or Jesus or any of a thousand other frames that we could have? Why does this message matter? So I, I have a brief article in the International Journal of Communication that kind of traces the history of the idea of the digital divide, but it, it's enough for now to say that this idea kind of emerges within the Clinton administration in the 1990s, and it's fundamentally a deficit approach to inequality. It asks what poor people lack and how we can get it to them so that they stop being poor. There were, of course, many subsequent revisions to this idea in the literature, focusing on spectrums of access or broader definitions of techno-social inclusion. But these revisions still largely retain that old binary at their core, just restated in more critical terms. And despite all these revisions, the, the really simple, basic, problematic binary between what Al Gore called information haves and information have-nots remains a remarkably durable idea in all sorts of policy and social service circles. It, it just feels right to position economic transition as a natural disaster that only the highly skilled will survive. So we want to figure out why. Um, this is generally framed, you know, like it's close cousin to STEM gap in terms of gaining access to the jobs of the future, even though we know, as this old BLS chart confirms, that the vast majority of new jobs being generated are in low-wage service sectors where you don't need to learn to code. What I want to know, then, is why this particular frame for inequality, the idea of the digital divide and close cousins like the STEM gap or the skills gap, seem so logical and sensible and resistant to critique. To do so, I focus on how our institutions are incentivized to buy into this approach and how they build it into their very everyday operations and their infrastructure. So let's talk about one specific important institution within the digital divide frame, the public library. So this subtitle is a quote from one of my librarians, Elena, explaining why she kicked people sleeping in the computer lab out of the library. So even though the library does much more than lend out books, its institutional mission is a matter of much debate in the internet era, given the easy availability of so many texts online and the drying up of public funds. Like we, all, we all know that everyone in this room is an expert knows the libraries are more necessary than ever, but we all know that we have to make that argument very often. Indeed, in, in 2004, there was a lot of talk in DC of radically downsizing the library system. So the system had been dealt a really public black eye in March of that year when a worm took down every single computer in the system for an entire month. Today, library officials talk about that as a sort of come-to-Jesus turnaround moment for the system uh, when they realized how high the stakes were. The library system was, like most of D.C. public services, understaffed and underfunded, victims of the austerity program that Anthony Williams had installed at Congress's behest. Um, so as a comparison, in 1975, the D.C. public library system had 620 full-time employees working at 20 branches. And in 2004, when the worm hit, they only had 430 employees working at 27 branches. So a hell of a lot less people were covering more territory. The month-long computer outage was kind of the most visible sign of a system that was barely holding itself together. Fast forward to March of 2015. And I'm at the Martin Luther King Jr. Central Branch, where I did most of my field work, uh, with Dave, the kind of mid-30s white man at the head of MLK's digital programming, Sherry, a mid-40s black woman, an upper-level administrator at MLK, and the Friends of the Library Charity Group, a group of middle and upper-class white retirees who lobby the library on policy changes, run literacy classes and book drives, and outside the library do a lot of like NIMBY campaigning against new housing construction. <laughs> Throughout a presentation on the library's upcoming renovation, our backs were to these glass cubicles that separate the Dream Lab presentation space from the Digital Commons Computer Lab. The Computer Lab's 150 seats were full, as usual, and dominated by the city's homeless population. 
mostly older black folks, more men than women, who walk over every day if they're not dropped off by the shelter shuttles that also do pick up runs in the evening. Dave, eyes gleaming, asked if we'd like a tour of the new maker space upstairs, a reclaimed meeting room intended as a preview of the fruits that the renovation would bear. So we walked past the librarian monitoring the, th the whirring 3D printer through the great hall where a mural of Dr. King overlooked local internet entrepreneurs setting up hundreds of chairs for their monthly demo series, up two floors on the elevator, past one of the video visitation rooms for DC jail, around the corner from the Black Studies Center, back into the cavernous stairwell that had been a gay cruising spot for much of the 80s, through some locked double doors, and into a sunny meeting room whose floor-to-ceiling windows looked out onto a Roof's Chris Steakhouse. It was hard not to get caught up in Dave's hopeful G wizardry as he showed off the 3D printers, the laser cutters, the CNC fabrication machine, and the scattered laptops. Dave pitched the maker skills that the Fab Lab would teach as a new literacy for a new economy, something that could help defeat the STEM gap and provide the creative, technical workers he said we're so desperately short on. Consumers would learn to maintain their devices and save the environment and skilled techies would have a space to inspire underprivileged communities. One library friend pitched it as a poetry lab to upgrade the arts for the 21st century. There was so much hope in that fab lab, much of it recycled from earlier pronouncements on the three-year-old computer lab that seemed so very far away downstairs, where most patrons spent most of their time, and which was itself a massive upgrade from the 14 Dells that had previously constituted the main computer lab of the central library branch of the nation's capital. There was so much pressure placed on those tools, that room, that library, and those librarians, even though it's now mostly used by library visitors rather than the homeless folks who are there all day, every day. Just like the Dream Lab startup space downstairs. The Fab Lab offers a kind of reassuring vision of the future in a city where a flood of new tech workers post-recession have been accompanied by a housing crisis and a jobs crisis. According to the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute, D.C. has seen a 29% rise in the number of homeless families and a 12% rise in total homelessness since 2011, and an active policing policy that has 5% of the city in jail, on probation, or on parole. The top 10% of income earners in D.C. make six times the bottom 10%, the highest disparity of any state, because the middle has largely fallen out of our local labor market since the recession. In a very real way, the post-internet library, the internet era library, the tools and people meant to overcome the digital divide, this embodies a hope that these massive structural challenges can be overcome with the right tools and the right skills. Indeed, the institution is literally rebuilt around this discourse of hope, this responsibility for local development. So what I hope to show today by way of a deep dive into the everyday life of the urban public library is that the hope in personal computing to overcome poverty is not naturally occurring. It must be produced and maintained by specific institutions with a stake in economic transition. DC public libraries produced this hope as a way of legitimating their existence in the internet era and as a way to manage their role as one of the last remaining safe public places for marginalized city residents. They had a big job to do. For the library to maintain their hope in, quote, using the technology to improve lives, as librarian Grant put it to me, it must necessarily regulate or eliminate other potential plans for the library space. So how does this conflict over what the library is for, and by extension, exactly what personal computing is for, manifest? So this is a joke that one of my librarians, April, regularly made with colleagues whenever they saw patrons engaged in self-talk, fighting with each other, watching porn, touching themselves or a partner, or bedding down for the night on a strip of cardboard in the reference section. She gives out imaginary stickers as she walks the library to patrons whom she thinks are using the space appropriately, inappropriately, or just wrong. And to, you know, to me this is extraordinarily condescending, but it, it captures something really important. April has a master's degree. She's a middle-class white woman who recently moved to the city for a secure but stressful job. She can tell you how to verify Google results, do basic HTML, and find your nearest polling station come election time. She loves open access and Barack Obama. She's an ideal liberal knowledge worker, and her professional identity is informed by a series of confrontations with not that. Poor or working class patrons with only a high school diploma, if that much younger or much older black and Latino patrons who have been priced out of DC housing, 
patrons with mental illness, patrons who mistake socialsecurity.com for socialsecurity.gov. These are her patrons, or customers, as she and most of her colleagues say. Like the public school or the clinic, the American public library system pursues a very liberal mission, open and accepting of all in search of self-improvement, in order to help those it serves assimilate into the norms and routines of the labor market and the local law and order regime. This has been true since at least the founding of the American Library Association in 1893. Um, so most of my librarians describe their profession in classed and gendered terms as a, quote, pink collar one, with April calling them, quote, mavens of knowledge. And this is a very long tradition. Um, white middle class women in the progressive era 100 years ago worked as what they called reader's advisors, teaching immigrant patrons to move away from entertainment materials like dime novels um, and towards Anglo-American classics. Um, and this would inculcate sufficient literacy to enter formal job and housing markets. This mission uh, took on renewed importance when the Clinton administration birthed that kind of hopeful digital divide discourse in the 1990s but also pushed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which gave the US some of the slowest, most expensive internet in the developed world, and made libraries pretty much the only place you could get it for free. More generally, how many places are left in American cities where you can spend all day in a comfortable public space without buying anything, have a wealth of learning opportunities at your fingertips, and receive free guidance from people with advanced degrees? Libraries, pretty much it. But those present needs for a public space conflict with the institution's needs for a space oriented towards that hopeful future of personal computing. And this conflict pops up again and again within library computing, the rules for it, and the selection and training of library personnel. So there's a lot of things that you can do with a PC, obviously. At the library, this is largely directed towards the professional norms of white collar knowledge work. For example, the librarian teaching intro to PC basics emphasizes both the skills of how to write or left click, excuse me, create folders, yada, 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 but also concepts, the different names for a flash drive, how deletion works, what she calls, quote, the proper language of the industry, the things that prevent people from being embarrassed at a job interview. The civil service exam is a constant reference point in these intro level how to use a computer classes, even though most students won't be applying for these mid-level bureaucratic jobs. These values are also built into the lab's personal computers and vice versa. Patrons use their library card to sign up for a session at a central terminal and are then directed to a queue displayed on a large screen mounted over on the wall. So there are 70 PCs in MLK's four-year-old digital commons lab. In 2012, Elena, who you met earlier, who supervised the three-hour waits for 14 computers in the old popular services lab, told me that even tripled the number of computers wouldn't be enough, and she was right. Um, especially in DC's sweltering summers when, unlike winter, there is no right to shelter for the homeless. And there can still be an hour-long wait for a PC. The Pharos login system not only manages the queue, it also allows librarians to monitor every session's activity from a central terminal and choose to end or extend the session. Patrons watching porn repeatedly may find a pop-up screen saying, please don't do that. They're not using the internet right. On the other hand, patrons who are working on a job application might ask the central desk for more time and have another half hour tacked on. Staffing decisions are also key. Choosing the correct librarian in turn chooses the correct way of using the internet. This is, on the one hand, a long-term issue of the librarian pipeline. So a lot of the veteran librarians that I interviewed really regret the transformation of library schools into iSchools. Um, and we see Becca's reading of the shift here while she was getting her master's in library science in 2000 um, as kind of like the tragic downfall of the profession, the embrace of technical over service values. And she's probably the most junior librarian I know who still calls her patrons patrons rather than customers, and she's in her late 30s. And then there's a further filtering at the local level in the hiring of librarians. So uh, Eugene, a mid-20s white librarian, explained to me here that the Digital Commons is 70 computers, it's Adobe Creative Suites, it's 3D printer and book printer, as well as the Dream Lab's glassed and closed conference rooms loaned out to local startups. All this is incomplete without a group of librarians who are younger, hipper, whiter, and more tech savvy than the branch's veterans. Their enthusiastic startup aesthetic is essential to the space. 
what Eugene called himself and his colleagues, the hipster contingent, performs the hope that kind of links personal computing with social mobility. They've been the source of a lot of debate in the librarians union because a large number of veteran black librarians were fired right before the hipster contingent was hired and the digital commons opened. But this story is incomplete because the library has you know, this specific form for personal computing, a specific organizational structure. You know, it's individualized into long rows of PCs or desks with plugs, transparent with glass cubicles and open air. Everyone at a PC is staring back at the glass cubicles where startups are working. But what we might conceptualize as the kind of powerful downward pressure of an institution's production of space is always, to a greater or lesser degree, resisted or reconfigured by people within it. So patrons have agency, obviously. First, I, I want to talk for a little bit about how homeless patrons, the kind of vast majority of regular library users at the computer lab, adapt to the library's organization of space. And then I want to explore how they craft new places kind of separate and distinct from that. So patrons are well aware that librarians are happy to help fill out social services forms for food stamps, affordable housing, et cetera, and they pick particular uh, librarians with a good reputation for this or that. Uh, most patrons also acknowledge that something like porn is doing the library wrong, most of it's filtered after all, but that they can get away with it with a little bit of work. You know, you choose the right site that hasn't been blocked yet, you switch between windows when a cop or a librarian walks behind you, you nonetheless keep hardcore porn open in a wide open room with 150 people in it. I never visited the library without seeing at least two screens covered in porn. And this takes a whole heck of a lot of skill that we should recognize. Like, there's an enormous amount of literacy to be able to navigate these systems. It's also, it also is a tacit recognition over years of interaction of an unresolved ideological conflict within most librarians. So as Rachel explains here, uh, librarians want to preserve the professionalism of the public access point and its hopeful future orientation towards knowledge pork. After all, you wouldn't watch porn at the office, I hope. But they also want to preserve the library's historically liberal orientation towards the free flow of information. This conflict between institutional professionalism and personal liberalism extends to other areas, but porn is really the first example of doing the library wrong that everyone I interview jumps to, just as job applications is the first example of doing the library right that everyone I interview jumps to. I see a similar pattern in patron interactions of the police who roam the library branches, hand on their pistol, five or six on duty at a time in MLK, they're walkie-talkie, the loudest thing in a quiet room. They have a control room upstairs to review their camera network. They're allowed to touch patrons where librarians are not. They tend to enforce norms for sleeping, drugs, fights, phones, theft, exposure, rather than personal computing proper. Unless a librarian calls them in to act as the kind of conservative right hand, sternly enforcing the liberal left hand's rules. And this happens all day. Uh, Mia, Ebony, Josie, and Terrell are part of an incredibly generous, welcoming crew of homeless black youth that I spent a lot of the three years of my field work hanging out with, mostly in the digital commons, but also in classes, standing in line for the bus or charity food, texting each other, whatever. Um, and any day they're not at a day program for a clinic or a visit with social services, which is often because being poor is an expensive, time-consuming way to live. They're at the library. But they only ended up at MLK in early 2014 because they moved from branch to branch, fleeing cops who hassled them for sleeping at a computer desk or talking too loudly on the phone. Finally, patrons adapt to institutional form not just through human-to-human -human interaction, but through human-computer interaction. So they have a whole slew of strategies to get around this login system. So Mia, before she was gifted a used laptop, would email whatever she was working on to herself before her session ended, run back and grab Josie's library card, and start a new computer session as soon as possible. And she told me it's not like you could complete something like a housing application in an hour, even if the librarians are super nice and give you another 20 minutes. But patrons don't just adapt. They also carve out their own places, distinct from the library's production of its space, as a training center for knowledge work. Some of these must be suppressed. Others can be incorporated into the library's hopeful vision of entrepreneurial personal computing. 
so there's a lot of play places in the digital commons. What my field notes always called noisy corner is a group of tables and chairs with no desktop PCs. And for 2013 and much of 2014, it was, especially after school let out, just taken up by super loud card games, mostly Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. Friends met there every day and cheered each other on like any other sporting event. But that's not using the library right. You wouldn't do that in the office. So one of the hip new librarians, Jeffrey Mohawk, mechanics overalls, invited a friend of his who lives in the suburb outside the city to drive in on weekends and organize official Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh leagues with jackets and badges and tournaments in the glassed-in Dream Lab space that's occupied by startups during the week. Problem solved. There's also a lot of collaboration here, um, even as personal computing in the digital commons is designed as a, a fairly solitary experience. You know, you have long rows of Dells all facing the same direction, kind of like a lecture hall. Collaboration is obviously encouraged in the glass cubicles in the back of the room where startups work and are quite loud, despite it being a library. And then there's a lot of analog entrepreneurship among patrons. Um, so drug sales, usually synthetic weed or crack cocaine, um, which the police crack down on quite hard, unsurprisingly. Um, there's uh, a team of kind of Craigslist pyramid schemers on their phones at the PC. Um, there's also <coughs> oil men. Uh, black Muslim men with uh, little vials of fragrance, either in belts on their chest or in you know, these little wooden racks that they carry around. Uh, they hang out before rush hour, pour over their phones, kind of map out the neighborhoods where they're going to sell oil. Cops mostly leave them alone. Uh, there's a vibrant repairs culture, too, where people trade peripherals or give each other tips for speeding up that used laptop or downloading anime. Uh, everyone comes to Mia for this. Um, but there's also analog work like how to fill out social services forms for maximum benefits, or like you know which exact bureaucrat to see at which exact office. But probably the most important use of the library space, especially for the homeless community, remember last truly public space in DC, is as a space for rest, a place to check email between dishwasher shifts, to stop after your day program because most shelters kick you out during the day, to sit and rest, and yes, sleep because it's 100 degrees out in our swampy summer, and neither shelter beds nor the sewer grates above the subway stop next to MLK are quiet, comfortable spaces at night, and because many psych meds are strong sedatives. And while, similar to the porn issue, librarians are kind of conflicted on this. The fact is that you can't sleep at your PC at the office, so you can't sleep in the computer lab. So they patrol, knocking on the desk of people dozing off, calling the police if they don't respond. So we've seen that this kind of hope in the entrepreneurial value of personal computing, the, this future orientation of public institutions towards knowledge work is not naturally occurring. It has to be produced. And the production of that space involves the regulation of emergent places that diverge from the institution's plans. The library is perhaps the easiest site in which to witness this dynamic because it is literally being rebuilt starting any day now, um, as the slogan goes, to become a new transformative space rather than the old transactional one. This three-year, $208 million renovation project requires, as Grant tells me here, admitting that the contemporary computer lab has failed and that it needs to be taken apart and put back together again. The homeless patrons watching YouTube or dozing off in the back do not fit the hope of the digital commons or the fab lab upstairs. And so those rest places, collaboration places, and play places that patrons built will be physically segregated from the startup workspaces, the seminar spaces, and the transformative technologies that will form the heart of the new library. So zooming back out, we see that the hopeful mission of digital uplift kind of raised the library's status in the eyes of local politicians and community leaders like the Friends. It secures this much needed renovation. It provides a way to make the overwhelming problem of urban homelessness much more simple and actionable. So at the most micro level, when the library is the only public place in the city, it's a really difficult decision as to whether to kick out a homeless patron with nowhere else to go, you know, watching YouTube all day. It's a very tough decision for people that are really passionate about their job. But the hope within the internet your future depends on it, makes that decision much easier. YouTube isn't job applications or a code academy, so you got to go. So kind of given the power and the repetition of this hopeful binary between information haves and haves nots, 
given how it keeps stymieing our critical thinking, given how it keeps rewiring our institutions in a ways that, against their best efforts and best intentions, ends up defeating their core mission, should we even be focusing on the digital divide at all? And I say yes, we should accept with revisions. Um, but we need to turn the Digital Divide Research Project away from a distributionist focus on deficits, on what poor people lack that makes them keep being poor, and towards a relational focus on technologies that institutionalize inequality, on relationships between wealth and poverty, labor management, et cetera, et cetera. From descriptions of who has what to investigations and explanations for how digital tools help management break labor or maintain the wealth gap between white and non-white households. We need a gestalt shift in our thinking that approaches inequality not as a bug, but as a feature of contemporary capitalism. Rather than asking what will correct the deficits of the digitally divided, we should see how these divides between strata are technologically reinforced and reproduced. I call this critical turn in digital divide studies technologies of inequality. And there are some brilliant scholars that are already pushing digital divide studies in this direction and away from counting the number of computers, phones, and skills that poor people have. Um, so Amy Gonzalez at Indiana is doing really fantastic uh, interview-based work on poor families' relationships to their phones and computers. She finds that low-income users' personal digital tech is marked by cycles of what she calls dependable instability. Things break, service goes out, signal drops in the library, the Starbucks are your best bets for internet. Maintenance is a lot of work, and the phone and the laptop in this perspective becomes a nexus for all other sorts of social issues. You know, who has access to a bank account? What are the politics of public access limits, and how long can you stay there? All of that is distilled in this broken phone. And this turn informs my own thinking on my next project on technologies used to hire, fire, and manage the labor market. And this begins with a collaboration with current Berkman Fellow Ifoma Junwa. Um, we're, together we're researching the history and design of online job applications and their implications for managerial behavior and employment discrimination. So according to Deloitte, 60 to 70 percent of job applicants go through online applications with personality questionnaires like this every year, asking how you feel if someone stole from you or whether in school you were one of the best students, yada, yada, yada. <sighs> In 2011, CVS settled out of court in Rhode Island for a discrimination suit against them for their use of personality questionnaires because we suspect they're an ADA violation. Kroger is undergoing a similar suit. Uh, plaintiff Kyle Beam accuses them of filtering applicants for personality disorders. These applications integrate scheduling software, skill and personality assessments, and background and credit checks. It's where the expectations of the labor market are set for employees, employers, and the unemployed. It's early days yet, but IFOMA and I are starting to see these technological intermediaries doing two really major things. First, even though they're advertised as automating hiring, they're not so much automating hiring as automating rejection. So systems like Unicru's HirePro automatically cull red light applicants uh, provide warnings about yellow light applicants and provide suggested interview questions for green light applicants based on their results in the personality and skill assessments. And then the decision on whether to hire them still comes down to the local manager. Second, vendors of these systems position them as key ingredients in the corporate dream of a lean, on-demand workforce. Having only the number of employees you need right now with exactly the skills you demand of them and nothing else. Um, and the, the language of this in their, like, their SEC disclosures and their like, uh, brochures uh, and the materials they send their clients, this, this precedes what we think of as the on-demand workforce in our micro-work platforms or in Uber or whatever um, by at least a decade, if not more. Like This is around in the mid-90s. So to conclude, you know, that's, that's where we're going next with this Technologies of Inequality project, exploring how the relationship between labor and management changes when rejection is automated and hiring is kind of de-skilled and centralized. It's the next step in my study of what I call the future of unemployment, of which the current book project is certainly a part. Uh, so as I conclude, I got some questions for you guys um, about my current and future work and a discussion we might have here about this approach. So, you know, for the future, what other mundane technologies kind of capture these important institutional dynamics and stratification effects? You know, where in your own research do you see something like a 
like a broken pay-as-you-go phone that captures these dynamics, or a you know an online job application. For the present, what other public institutions besides schools and libraries are involved in turning the problem of poverty into a problem of technology? Many of you are working in places like this. You know, where do you see these kind of institutional reforms taking place? And for the past. Are there historical analogs to the contemporary focus on learning to code for the jobs of the future? Other moments in history where the assumption that changing job seekers' skills would change the quality or quantity of jobs available? You know, what's the longer history here? So that's me. Those are the questions that I want to talk about with you guys. Thank you very much for having me today. I look forward to discussion. Um, we have a mic going around, so just raise your hands and let rip. We ask you to speak into the microphone just so we get it on um, the recording. Okay. Hi, uh, Meryl Alper, faculty associate here at Berkman and professor at Northeastern University. Um, thank you for the talk. The posters from the from the get go, um, really compelling um, physical material that that sets in motion your, um, your overall narrative. I want to ask a little bit about, this is like the classic question, what do you mean by technology? Yeah. Um, uh, specifically related to what it sounded like you were describing were techniques of inequality, not necessarily technologies. So like ways of doing the computer right or ways of doing the computer wrong. Um, People learn techniques via technologies, but there's a there's a, an embodied practice of how one sits, how one doesn't, and so and the and the so where techniques and technologies uh, are they the same to you? Or are they different? And how that fits into the construction and the reproduction of structural inequality? Do we want to stack them or do one by one? We'll just go. Okay, so um, I will I will take the cop out on the class question by saying both. Um, and I, I think, like you know, if we take the kind of like uh, you know social construction of technology approach, you know, your your, your Langdon winner or whatever, um, you know, there are certain values and practices and ways of doing things that are that are built into these machines. Um, and I, I think the clearest example of that within this portion of the ethnography um, is the kind of login system for personal computing. Um, where it has certain values of surveillance that people are very familiar with if they've been involved in the social service system for many years. Um, it has certain values um, of regulating uh, what is a productive or unproductive use of the computer. Um, libraries, if they want to receive federal funding, much, must install some sort of filtering system as part of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Children's Internet Protection Act, you know, that Time Magazine thing with the kid going, <laughs> that thing. Um, so I, I think a lot of these values are embedded in the system. Um, to point elsewhere in the ethnography, I also spent a lot of time with STEM-focused charter schools. The one I was with, um, the kind of uh, student data system was called School Force. Uh, it was not just modeled on Salesforce. It was built from Salesforce code. Um, and this had a, you know, gave teachers and administrators a particular relationship to managing student data and enhancing productivity um, that was quite similar to customer relationship management. Um, to return to the future project, like in the um, online job application stuff, uh, you know, one thing if Oma and I are doing is just like applying to a bunch of jobs, you know. And you know, one thing we see, especially in retail, is that you know, you, you move through your work history pretty quickly. Um, you, move, you know, the personality question might take a little while, but the thing they're super interested in, the thing that takes five screens to do and has a million options and forces you to have your signature on is scheduling. Like they really want to demand this like wide open schedule about where you'll be able to fit into certain slots. Um, so I think that it, uh, within it, holds certain values about what they uh, imagine their workforce to be. Uh, so the cop out is always, you know, dialectics or whatever we want to call it. Who else? Hi, my name is Diane Williams. I'm a computer scientist nice and uh, <laughs> ed tech entrepreneur. Um, I want to say 
I've, I've been a volunteer for, this will be the beginning of my sixth year being a substitute volunteer at the Harvard Square Homeless Shelter. Awesome. And uh, which I, it's a happy accident. I'm so glad. I wish I'd done it years before. Yeah. And I think they've had a fairly high success, as a student-run facility, mm -hmm. they've had a very high success rate of getting people out of homelessness because they have three uh, computers there, but they t they're not allowed to watch porn. Mm -hmm. They can listen to all the music they want, mm -hmm. but they cannot watch porn. Um, they... They specifically sit down like like case by case basis for those that want to help, mm -hmm. and there are many of them. Especially when I do the overnight shifts, when I have to wake somebody up at four thirty five in the morning because they have to like get their coffee because they're on their way to a job. Yep. And many people I will see for a while, and then I don't see them anymore, and I go, oh, I miss Paul. Bob. And then I go, no, that's a good thing yes. that so and so's yes. not here. Yes. You yes. know. <laughs> so it's like, wow, this is working. So it make, it's yeah. a very rewarding experience. Yeah. And I was just looking now because recently they're looking for volunteers for resource advocates mm -hmm. for people to sit down with them on a case by case. Some like some people have really immediate mm -hmm. needs. You know, the ones that have like mental issues, that's a separate mm -hmm. thing. But for the ones that are just near me, nearly like workforce employment and development, I was just sitting here as you were talking about who is supporting the. You ha you sort of have to look at your constituency. Mm -hmm. If there are a lot of. Um, unemployed people in your space to say, hmm, maybe one of some of the friends of the library can volunteer to do, we have to, we have to get them out at eight in the morning. Yep. They come from seven at night to eight in the morning because the church, you know, you have to clean it and, you know, people have to go to school and work. So there's no coverage. And maybe on Christmas and certain holidays, that's when they can stay all day. What I'm trying to say is when we're forced to, we're not that we want to, but we're forced to ha have them go out to the day, Maybe having continuation of what the, the, the shelters do, you know, using technology, using it, but they also need, for those who need help, so like you say, that people are just sleeping or just watching porn, right? that's a very um, negative representation of the homeless population because it's quite diverse. Yeah, I, I could not agree more about that. Um, I spent much of my time in grad school, or before grad school and during the beginning of grad school, doing re-entry services for folks that had been in hospital or in prison for a long time um, and were often homeless. Um, so I was helping folks get a job, get housing, that kind of thing. And that's what made me interested in this work. Um, I, I think the, so what you're, one of the things that I really um, get out of what you're saying is that, uh, kind of similar to Meryl's question, um, you build a space of specific values in it, and then you act on that, 100%. Um, I think, and I, I think there are important moves forward that library systems are making, and more library systems can make that are very much in that spirit. I will put a caveat on that before I say that, in that people are homeless because they don't have houses, um, and the overwhelming problem of homelessness in Boston and Washington DC is a crisis of affordable housing. You know, we, we can, uh, we should do as much, um, you know, kind of uh, reparative, restorative interventions as we can, uh, but if we are not making housing cheaper, it's just not going to solve the problem. This is why DC has seen this really crazy thing that I have never heard of in any other city where family homelessness skyrocketed. Um, individual homelessness crept up, but not nearly at the level of, of family homelessness. And it was often these like working moms who have you know two or three kids uh, and can't get childcare because they have to go to work, but to qualify for childcare they need to be in stable housing. And there's this kind of bureaucratic loop that everyone gets caught in. So there's the overarching structural issue of there's not enough housing. Regarding you know building a space with a different set of values in it. Um, I could not agree with that more. Um, and I think that uh, some library systems, like uh, particularly San Francisco, um, are really, really good at this. Um, and uh, I believe, I want to say Seattle as well, um, either Seattle or Portland, uh, have hired a series of social workers that um, work on the floor, both training librarians and hooking people up with specific social services. Um, they have started to use the library because they know that's where people are at as a home base for other social services, like the health departments or like workforce training organizations and the muni government, that sort of thing. Um, but there can be some tension there because uh, you know some suggestions were made to do that in DC and some of the older librarians um, that I talked to were, were kind of resistant to that because it's not 
what a library is for in their training um, in, in the classic MLS. Some of the younger librarians were a little more excited about it and would push people to get in. There was some really interesting stuff um, with signups for the ACA that was built out of the library that was really strong. Um, they, despite the horror of DC families not being able to visit their incarcerated relatives in person, providing a free video visitation within DC Library is a, is a fantastic alternative within those structural constraints. Um, but they you know, kind of pushed back on stuff like having more social services in there. Um, they hired a social worker, uh, partly in response to the condo building across the street starting to complain about homeless people hanging out outside the library. Um, but most librarians had never met the social worker. You know, she mostly works upstairs and does policy stuff. Uh, so I, I think like these like wraparound services that you're talking about on a very small scale at your local clinic can absolutely totally happen within libraries, and I, I very much hope that more people are following the kind of San Francisco model. Um, thanks for leading this talk. It was really great and interesting. Um, What's your name? I'm Kira. It's me, Kira. Uh, so you started the talk by showing some statistics about the, that alluded to the fact that um, the fastest growing industries in the U.S. Uh, in, you know, are creating roles that are not necessarily uh, related to technological literacy or know-how. Um, and and the throughout your talk sort of threaded some ideas that there, there's a mismatch here between both the aims of, uh, you know, of the programs these libraries are running and and the needs of the population also attitudes and and sort of racial divides as well in terms of what what should be used for what people should be learning about and i just wanted to get a little more information from you about how that fits in you know some of these roles as you know all industries become more technology focused, will have an element of computer and technological, technological literacy to them. But I'd, I'd love to hear you speak more on that and also in relation to the work that you mentioned that you're doing now on, on job seeking. Sure, thank you for that. Um, and I, I think this is the big structural issue that I'm concerned with in, in all of my projects is like what what makes someone employable? Um, and, I, and I think you're exactly right to say that there is some amount of digital literacy that is useful, if not required, in every single one of these jobs. So my wife is an RN over at BMC. Um, and as part of her union, honestly, she is like trains a lot of the other nurses in just how to use the new tech that they get into. So that absolutely, totally happens. Um, I think when you know President Obama gets on stage, got on stage, and talked about like the jobs of the future, filling the STEM gap, provided the skilled workers that we need, this is absolutely not that. Like that, that is uh, technical people writing code for consumer technology in the public imagination, but you know, B2B obviously would, no one would sniff that. So I, I think there's a disconnect between the, the discourse of what we need and the reality of how the labor market is actually growing. This points to, in the long term, a stark bifurcation in the labor market between a, a small number of highly skilled knowledge workers uh, in finance, tech, that kind of stuff, and a very large number of service workers making crap money servicing the lifestyles of those folks. Uh, Boston is a very stark example of this. Um, Y'all had a dining workers strike, what, two months ago. Um, so, I, so there's that disconnect there. There is a kind of like overarching theorization of that disconnect that floats around in some uh, particularly Marxist circles that you know driving up all these like learn to code initiatives every you know one laptop per child in all of our schools replacing language requirements of computer language requirements all this is just a way to increase 
the supply of skilled labor such that we drive down wages. You know, we just have too many people for jobs, and now programmers become much cheaper. I think that may be like an after effect of some of these institutional dynamics, um, but I, I am always very suspicious of like large top-down ideological or economistic drivers for these things. So in the, in the book project, I kind of explain this as um, a process of institutional reform that relates very closely to what you said about the racial divide between skilled knowledge workers working in helping professions like librarianship um, and majority black and Latino homeless patrons hanging out all day at the library because there is no other public space available. Um, and I, I think that for my librarians, for my teachers that I interviewed, absolutely for my civic-minded startup types that I interviewed, probably for most people in this room, the idea that you go to school, pick up some good skills, and get a good job, that's true. Like, it worked. Like, that, that is true. It is uh, true of you, me, my friends. Like, that is true. It is true in our social circles. It is grossly unrepresentative of the overall population. Like, the, so I am in the, uh, what is it, the 29 to 38 census cohort. Guess where I am in that? I won't. Uh, and like the, the most dominant educational experience in my census cohort is not college, it's some college. Like that's I think like a third is like people who start but don't finish. And then completing college at, or not attending college at all are about equal. Um, so I, I think what happens is that we end up making policy and redesigning our institutions around our own experiences, around the things that worked for us. But that just doesn't change the number of jobs that exist out there or how well they pay or how cheap housing is. Yeah, um, like, yeah just to comment on that, it's interesting because you have this, um, <clears throat> I experienced with, with, within my own experience, you know, I had all these skills going to college, but as a first generation um, student, I didn't have the network. Right. Um, so is there, in this perception shift that you call for, I'm also, I'm Cassandra, I'm a journalism I'm candidate at the Extension School. Um, so is there, it, it seems like the one-on-one -on -one training that you get on a computer experience is really isolated, mm. so that if you're gonna network to get a job, yet there's no collaborative spaces, like, is there any integration of that social experience in these technological skills? Or are you just, you know, or is the focus on, you know, coders and tech skills very, I mean, there's just a disconnect. So there's, or is there any integration of the reality of what it actually takes to get a job in training yeah. in these programs? And is the attitude of librarians who have to suddenly deal with social services or this population a reflection of um, a changing demographic or their own, like, bias into what the perfect patron looks like? It's two separate questions. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I feel you. It's a comment and a question. <laughs> comment in the form of an extended essay. Yeah. Um, Classic. No, I, I do the same thing. Um, OK, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how they get there to that isolating skills training experience. Then we'll talk about how we get out of it. So how do we get there um, is, is partly um, through another process of organizational reform. Um, in sociology, we call this institutional isomorphism, the process by which organizations in, engaged in similar ventures come to look and act a lot alike. One of the channels by which libraries and schools start acting more like startups are these networking and professionalization ventures um, that train them and spread ideas and show what the model for a good employee and a good outreach looks like. So in education, um, that's stuff like TFA. So even for the teachers that I interviewed and followed around who were not working at a charter school and had some Teach for America experience in their back, lots of them did, but even those who did not have Teach for America experience regularly attended Teach for America workshops, Teach for America funded galas, um, Teach for America grant initiatives in association with the Gates Foundation or whoever. Um, 
these kind of professional networks that tie similar people together and help reproduce similar ideas in similar ways. Um, and I don't think this is a, uh, you know, I have strong disagreements of TFA, but I don't, I don't think at the level of um, organizing these events to like train teachers is in any way kind of a nefarious thing. I, the problem of teaching at like a high school that I was at, um, the problem of working in a library that is effectively the largest homeless shelter in the city is overwhelming. It is a, it is a really tough job. Um, and when you have overwhelming demands, you look for solutions. And there are a lot of um, powerful networks, um, TFA, I would say the iSchools Consortium involved in librarianship training, um, the Gates Foundation involved in grant making, um, that help provide examples and outlets by which these overwhelming problems can be made a little more sensible and a little more actionable. And that helps make the problem a little more simple. As far as how we get out of that um, and go into making a more um, social experience, in the library for, for skills training. Um, in MLK, that was like totally possible. It was lurking around the edges in something like the fabrication lab um, or in something like, the, uh, like a repairs lab they started to do now and then. Like those were social spaces where people could hang out and get their hands dirty. It ended up not like it ended up not being attended by the folks who use the library every day. It ended up being a, attended by folks who were on the email list um, and come to the library after work in their suit um, and do that kind of stuff. Um, I, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why that is. I, I think it's a possibility um, that just wasn't capitalized on. Part of it may be just like the everyday interactions that the majority of patrons have with the librarians are in that more solitary, non-conversational space, so they're not um, expecting to get anything different. Um, there is often a confrontational relationship, especially if the police. Um, there is a sense that certain rooms in the library are for certain people and not others. Like there's the, you know, there's literally a glass wall between the computers, which are quiet, and the collaboration space for startups, which is loud, and they can see each other all day. Um, so some of those values are kind of built into there. It's a possibility, and I'm, I'm sure just as there are libraries that are doing social services better, there are places that are doing skills training in a more professionalized, networked way. Um, you know, whether or not that solves this problem of like not having enough good jobs to go around, you know, that's another question. But um, yeah, it, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. I preempted the mic. I stole it from her. Um, That's okay. My name's Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea. And I just wanted to follow up actually from hers as well. And I think what um, I'd like to get at is just more the existential question of what the purpose of the libraries is. I mean, you've given us a lot of really compelling examples of things that, you know, really look, go beyond the realm of, I guess, workforce development yeah, in general, sure. right? And you've been citing a lot of the trends that are uh, broader, pointing to the broader economic trends that make this less of an intractable problem. So part one is, should we just be focusing on labor market preparation as the core mission driver of the libraries? And part two, if that's the case, what, how would you like to see the technology narrative switched? We've, we've seen that this is a mismatch, right? But you know, pointing to other people's works who've also you know, problematized this idea of the digital divide, Virginia Eubanks, you know, um, thinking about the ways that you know, uh, low wage work is already very much tied to technology mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Um, uh, as, as, along with those other bigger things, Tyler Cowen, the big 20-80% divide of the economy in general, should we be looking at broader social safety net questions mm -hmm. as opposed to, uh, and, and it's, you know, the technological role, uh, core role that plays more broadly? Uh, yeah, yeah, how do you want to recast the technology and workforce mission? Should libraries be solely focused on workforce training? No. Okay. <laughs> Next question. I didn't know, but... Um, <laughs> So, uh, I, I, and I mean, I, I don't say that out of like spite for their mission, but just because the skills training doesn't solve this. Like, it, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how skilled you are if there's no jobs for you to apply to. So for that, that bare reason, I, want, I would hope that a lot of our institutions move away from the skills training myth. Um, and a lot of other uh, people talk about this kind of stuff in different settings. Um, Tressy Cottom's wonderful new book, uh, Lower Ed, talks about this in terms of the education gospel, the idea that if you keep getting degrees, you know, you will kind of stack up into success. Um, so no, I, I don't think that's the way to go just because it doesn't solve this problem. Um, I do think that there are ways to better integrate um, tech into social services at the library because uh, 
if there are some training changes. So most of my younger librarians who had been trained in iSchools said they felt like completely unprepared for the portions of their job that were effectively social work um, because they had been largely trained on the more um, technical aspects of their job. This is one reason I would love to work in an iSchool is to like do like just helping skills training, like how to ask a good question, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but so I, I think if we change the training, we can start changing that a little bit. Um, I think if we accept libraries as community centers, which is easy to say in theory, but harder to do in practice because you you know you got to come down to making decisions about how many books are we going to have, what is this room for, how many are people allowed to sleep here overnight? Like you know, it's easy to say that in practice. Uh, easy, easy to say in theory, hard to do in practice. Um, tech to return to Merrill's question, like, ends up tying a lot of these values together. Um, so one really hopeful thing that I saw at MLK um, was I helped out with their design for the new 311 system that the city was making and which the library kind of became a hub for. And this was like a phone tree or a website um, that you would navigate through and you kind of say like a problem you were having, like, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm, I am about to be homeless. I need a lawyer for X. Uh, my landlord is doing Y. Um, and you'd be directed to the right social service agency based on that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited for that, that kind of thing. And I, I think libraries in general are, are extraordinarily well positioned um, and in many ways already do act as community centers that link people to other kind of social services. So the, you know, the big overarching problem is still that. But I think there are a, way, a lot of ways to eat around the edges in terms of redesign. Um, in the interest of time, can we stack those last two yeah. questions? Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. I am I'm totally on board with your suggestion of reframing uh, the way we're talking about tech and taking a more critical posture to how it reinforces um, you know, inequalities. And so I'm curious what you would say the upshot of that is in terms of sort of the substantive or pedagogical services that libraries offer. And so in particular, do you think that, you know, what tools are going to dismantle that house? Um, is it, is teaching someone to code at Code Academy like technocratic self-congratulation that's not going to do anything? Uh, and how would you, how would you, you know, reformulate that to make it genuinely empowering? Um, or maybe it doesn't need reformulation. Uh, and so that's all to presume maybe, you know, that that's, something libraries are supposed to provide too. Um, so I'd be curious basically wherever you want to run with that one. So and, and also uh, oh, okay. No, we're not gonna okay. Yeah, oh, go for oh, it. Okay. Dude. Great. Um, hey Dan. Uh, my name is Colin Reinsmith. Nice I'm a know. professor in the School of Library and Information Science at Simmons College Fantastic. and a faculty associate here at the Berkman Klein Center. Um, you've hit on many pain points, I should say, uh, in my field. Um, so I appreciate that because it's super productive and I really appreciate that. So um, I'm going to throw two quick questions at you. I love the fact that you um, identified the agency of patrons, um, and I would love to hear more about how that might be a starting point for mm -hmm. informing our field mm -hmm. on the one hand, and also uh, curious to know sort of your message for those who are funding the field also, who are, I would argue, putting a lot of pressure on libraries for this change yeah. and wondering as a path forward you know, what you would say about that. Yeah. Um, let's, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer that and segue into that. I think I can do this. Um, so the, um, I, the primary audience for my turn from digital divides to technologies of inequality is people who study the digital divide and keep counting the number of computers that people have. Um, because I, I think that mostly the, the economists are taking our lunch. Like the, you know, this big conversation that has been dominating um, 
a lot of the public sphere for the last, since the recession, on growing inequality. What does it mean? How can we solve inequality? Where is inequality? Where does it come from? Am I inequality? Like, that is largely being tackled at the macro scale by people like Piketty, which is super useful and very helpful. Um, but I think people who have this like intimate understanding of uh, how the workforce is changing, what our technologies, uh, how our technologies are involved in that, how our technologies tie us to other institutions and other people, we have like these great tools to be able to make better arguments about um, how inequality is happening and being reproduced. So to, to go back to Amy Gonzalez's work, the stuff about you know thinking about who uses prepaid phones and why is a really quick inroads to saying like, oh, look who doesn't have a bank account. What can we do to help the unbanked, as we call? Um, you know, maybe we could have postal banking. Maybe we could have banks and libraries. You know, it's 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 an, it's an inroad into that question where instead of like looking at symptoms, we start to get more at the core of things. Um, so to to that end, and what happens in libraries, I, I think the the question becomes not what do you do with that particular technology, like the broken phone, but how does it tie you to other institutions that are overseeing or reproducing this kind of skyrocketing inequality, be they banks, be they hospitals, be they jobs, whatever, whatever, um, and you use this broken phone or this online job application as a way to say, okay, what kind of conflicts are embedded in this kind of thing? What does the, the patterns that I keep seeing in the use of this stuff tell me about how my city is changing or how social services are changing? You start from the thing and you branch out to what it ties you to, to your bank account, to your employer, to the system of background checks that screen out people with a record, that kind of thing. So you start from there and build networks outwards. I want us to begin with the device rather than ending with the device. So in terms of talking about the tech and moving away from that to institutional reform, what do patrons want? I mean, this is a, this is a democracy, right? Like we, you know, for now. Um, <laughs> the, like libraries, libraries can do what we make them do. Like, uh, you know, these are uh, community spaces that we can intervene in and talk about. However, what we know from long ethnographic studies of community meetings, and I'm thinking particularly of the critiques of community policing, like getting the police really involved in the community and you know, coming around to the local neighborhood watch and stuff like that and talking to them, um, is that those democratic habits uh, and the time and availability and literacy to go to those meetings are concentrated in a very small slice of people. This is part of the reason why community policing doesn't work, because it just gets you know, really rich people in the neighborhoods to start complaining about noisy kids. Um, so it is a democracy, but we also need to inculcate those uh, democratic habits. I think that um, this is kind of can be hard and overwhelming for librarians to have to deal with hundreds of people every day. Uh, regularly talking to patrons is a good idea. It is something that should be constantly happening, responding to patron needs and being willing to say, that's something that I didn't know the library needed, and I might not agree with what it's for. If people need a place to eat at the library, if people need more bathrooms at the library, if people would appreciate having you know, rooms to, private rooms to talk with their jobs counselor at the library, um, that I think there needs to be a willingness to take those complaints very seriously, even if they depart from our vision of what the library is for. Now, the other challenge that you pointed to, of course, is that our vision of what the library is for is often set by people who don't work at the library, especially these grant funding agencies that are responding um, to conditions of austerity. Um, and, you know, this is going to be my blunt Marxist side coming out, but, you know, if we didn't need those grant agencies, then they wouldn't be able to tell us what to do with our libraries. Um, so there's been a, you know, historic drop in public coffers um, since the early 2000s, but especially reaching up after the recession. Um, and tax revenue has just dried up. So if we start stealing more things from rich people and putting them in libraries... <laughs> then we don't need to ask rich people for their money very nicely, uh, and then they'll do whatever they tell us to do with their libraries. Right, that would be democracy. Um, so I, you know, there's, a, there's a top level concern here that is not just specific to libraries, but is specific to every social institution, in, in particular schools, um, share a lot of these same dynamics. Um, I, I think 
in terms of making the pitch to funders, you know, that's a macro level thing about, you know, how you how you talk to your your state reps and stuff like that, you know, stay angry, make your five calls. But um, in terms of making the pitch to funders, I, I would be interested in seeing um, more library agencies uh, connect their patrons' experience and their patrons' story to those funders. Um, uh, having funders visit, having uh, patrons go to the pitches for grants and stuff like that. Um, it's a really hard thing because of all these democratic uh, anti-democratic, democratic norms uh, that dictate who gets in the room. Uh, but I, I think if we start changing who gets into the room, we can kind of break out of that bubble. You know, like the, I mean, that's the, the first question they always teach you in ethnography school is like, who is in the room? You know, who is not in the room and who is in the room? Um, I think we just need to keep asking ourselves that in our school board meetings, in our library meetings, um, our grant funding meetings, and that kind of stuff. I think I'm getting the sign. So uh, thank you guys so much. This was really wonderful. <laughs>